Hello and welcome to today's weekly wind up with me, Milton Brown. On today's show, we have Brian Stalin, Managing Director of Stafflex, and also joining us today is Professor Paul Ward from the University of Huddersfield. The three topics of discussion today are the living wage, zero hours contracts, and the impact of the election. The first topic up for discussion is the living wage. The living wage is a hourly rate of pay which is set independently and updated annually. The factor that led to the hourly rate goes on the basic cost of living in the UK. As it stands, companies pay the living wage on a voluntary basis. Take a look at our VT. It should be, it should wear equal, I mean, all right, a little bit less, depending on the job you do, but, you know, it should be equal, really. Uh, well, I voted Labour at the election because one of the things I wanted was um, everyone, the national minimum wage should be living wage. I'm, I'm OK about them being different because it depends on, I think, the shopping and with the high rate of, you know, when you go shopping and things like that and whatever. So uh, £6.50 is all right by me. I feel like if you're not earning enough to live off, then what's, you're not going to want to work, are you? You're not going to want to work because you're not earning enough to live on, you're not earning enough money while you're working to live on, so I feel like you should at least be earning enough to live on. Well, I, I think that the national minimum wage should be pitched to the level that people can live on. I don't think uh, there should be a gap between what uh, the, the economists say you need to live and what the government will pay you, if, you know, uh, well, sorry, employers will pay you uh, at the government's behest. So I don't understand the reason for the difference, frankly. How, how do you feel about it being different? Because there's a lot of mixed reactions there from the general public. Well, if we've got a minimum wage um, and we've got a living wage and you have to wonder why they're different because if you can't live on less than the living wage, why would you allow employers to pay an amount less than that? So we should just be transforming the, the or combining the minimum living wage and raising the, uh, the minimum wage. Uh, I think it's a very complex subject. <clears throat> uh, the national minimum wage is, uh, has been installed by the politicians. Whether it's enough or not, I don't know. The living wage has, uh, has been generated by a group of families in London who found that they did not get enough through their wage packet to uh, afford rent, milk, bread, butter, etc. The difficulty is, I think that probably we should be paying the living wage throughout the country. There should be a differential between the North, for example, and London because the costs actually are different. However, uh, I think the minimum wage and the living wage should come together uh, because <coughs> uh, people cannot afford to live on £6.50 an hour. Okay. Well, at the end of the day, then, why, where do you draw the boundary with regards to London? Is that is just London? What about Birmingham? Is it, you know, can, can we really just draw the boundary and say, because the standard of living is higher in London, they're going to pay... More. Of course, it's not as if someone who's on the living wage can afford to live in London without a whole range of benefits. If, if their income right. is at, at the level of the living wage, they're still going to rely on a, a system of benefits. And actually, they're the things that subsidise employers in London to pay less than, than the market value of their employees. So you could take the view that you continue with the benefit system that props up people in employment, um, or you could just say that employees in London really need to respond to all those costs that people have in London and, and pay more. Um, what that would mean is that you did get differential wages in different parts of the country, um, but you, you tend to, in any case, because some areas, uh, some, some areas there's uh, less demand for particular skills and so on, so that the market work that operates in those ways. It, it, it's very interesting. <clears throat> if you rent a one-bedroomed house in Huddersfield, it might cost you, I don't know, £150 a week. If you rent a one-bedroom house or apartment in London, it's probably going to cost you £500 a week, and that's a significant difference. And uh, you have to be able to afford that. Uh, and if you're on 650 in London, you can't afford it. OK. OK. 
Okay, well, thanks for that, gentlemen. Um, two schools from Huddersfield have been given the go-ahead for expansion and improvement plans. Kirkley's councillors have granted planning permission for £7.9 million pound primary school of, for Royds Hall. The school will eventually hold 420 students. This is in addition to 862 students at the high school on the same site. Meanwhile, councillors also approved an extension and alterations to existing Ormondbury School, Junior School, sorry, on Southfield Road. It, is, it has become a new special education needs school for 164 children. Zero hour contracts. There is a lot of arguments around zero hour contracts and a lot of people talking about zero hours contract. Some people agree that we should have zero hours contracts and some people don't. Just take a look at our VT again and let's have a, have a look and see what's been said about zero hours contracts. I think it's a con. I think it's used by the Tories to suggest that it, it artificially changes unemployment figures so it looks like more people are in work. We're paying out more now in tax credits than ever. So although unemployment's at record low, we're actually paying out more in benefits. So it's just a self-defeating idea. But obviously for yourself, zero-hour contracts can be work around kids, like family members, obviously. If you've got a zero-hour contract, you can be doing other things on the side. I've actually applied for some job done, universal job match. And I know a few lads who've actually done it, you know what I mean? Oh, I think it's disgusting. I don't think you should have that because people are secure. Either it's like me, I'm working part-time at the moment and I'd like another 20 hours job. I wouldn't like to do the zero hours because then you'll sort all your money out and get it all sorted by the door and everything and then the next minute you could be out of the way and you've got to redo it all again and I don't think that's right. My son-in-law's on a, 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 a zero hours arrangement with a security company and uh, they feel free to uh, stand him down or, or, or call him at a moment's notice and uh, he more or less has to go on with it because it, it, three, three, three strikes and you're out. In other words, if he refuses to do what they want three times, he doesn't get any more work. So with that sort of disincentive, uh, it really uh, is, is, is very unfair. And uh, it, it, it means that a lot, a lot of poor devils are trying to make a living on a, on a very uncertain basis. Why, why are zero hours contracts so controversial? Well, <laughs> if, I, if I can go first, um, I, I feel quite passionate about zero hours contracts because I think there's a lot of misinformation about it. The fact of the matter is there are only 2.3% of the working population on zero hour contracts. 54% uh, of those are, uh, something like 25% are actually students and it suits them because they can only work up to 20 hours anyway, uh, if, if, as you'll know from university. Um, a lot of others are carers who actually uh, will want to work when they choose to work rather than being forced to work. Uh, one of the misconceptions uh, is that a zero hours contract, and, and I think they're just passing legislation to remove the right for it to be exclusive, mm -hmm. um, is that um, you actually have the same rights as you do on a normal contract of employment. So you're entitled to holiday pay, sick pay, maternity pay, and all those other things. And a, a lot of the information we've seen has been sensational and unfounded. Well, I'm going to take an alternative view, um, because I would agree that a, a large number of people on them um, are students, and it might seem that they welcome zero-hour contracts, but actually what they need to do, like everyone else, is to be able to budget regularly. So if they're allowed to work up to 15 or 20 hours a week, then actually you know, they have budgets that operate on that basis. And to go to work and to do half of a shift and be sent home because there's no work for them doesn't allow them to do that. Um, it, it purely gives the flexibility to the employer rather than to the person in work. I think the other thing it does is it encourages employers to devalue their employees. It encourages extremely high turnover because they know they're going to alienate their employees. And so what they need to do is they need to constantly employ new people to ensure that they're going to get the people to cover the shifts. Um, because they, they just see, they don't see employees as people to be valued or to be trained or to be developed. They see them as the form of cheap labour that zero-hours contracts 
um, imply. Although you said it's sensationalised, but th there is a view that it's open season to be by for employers to exploit people. I mean, Paul. Uh, yes, we, <coughs> we we had a client who decided to go to zero hours contract, uh, and they had people who they wanted them to work 40 hours. And you're absolutely right; they could roll up at nine o'clock and be sent home. But actually, the matter, the, the, the fact of the matter was that their workforce changed within a matter of weeks because they weren't prepared to put up with that and they went and found jobs where they were going to get meaningful employment. And the benefit was that actually the employer had to come off zero hours contract to get a regular workforce. Okay, so it balanced itself out. But that, that's an employer who learns a lesson because they, yeah. they mm -hmm. seek to value the employees and yeah. an, awful lot of them, an awful lot of employers don't. They just, they just work their way through lots of 17, 18, 19 year olds um, who they treat appallingly, who, who are then are taught that, that employment isn't something that's about mutual respect, it's actually about getting your best out of the other person, and that doesn't lead to, to respect after, after the experience. No, I, I, I appreciate that. <clears throat> but if 25% of students, uh, and there was an interesting thing that came out in the general election, that something like 30% were actually employed by employment uh, labour ministers on zero hours contracts, 2.3% of a 30 million workforce is a very, very small percentage, and a lot of those are actually doing it by choice. Students do it by choice in the hospitality, leisure and catering industry. A lot of people do it by choice. Um, and carers, I think, make up something like 50% of it. Uh, and, and if it's 2.3%, it's not a huge amount. That suggests that most employers are not applying zero hours contracts to me. How do you then negotiate with your recruitment, as in StaffLex, with employers, do they, do, they, do they ask you for zero hours contracts or minimum wage and everything else? Is that a barrier to your, uh, your business? It, it's, it's an interesting one which we grapple with. We do not deal with any companies that offer and insist on zero hours contracts, but the, you have to recognise that when we're providing temporary labour, they are on uh, terms of engagement they are not on zero hours contracts and we can never actually guarantee to somebody who's looking for temporary work that we can give them 40 hours or 50 hours a week. And a lot of people come to us, students come to us because they don't want 40 hours, they want 5 or 10 hours or 15 hours. We have companies who uh, don't need people all week, they just need people for one day because that's the way their business cycle is. So you know, it, it, it seems to work pretty well. Okay, so thanks for that gentlemen. Okay, join us after the break where we'll be looking at the impact of the election. See you soon. However large or small your business, attracting new customers requires dedication and a lot of patience. Just like fishing, but you also need the right gear. Rods, reels, lines, Hooks, sinkers, lures, tackle box, tackle bag, net, bait, gas gloves, clothes, and pocket knife lunch. Or you could simply advertise with KLTV. Online, grow your business and your clientele. KLTV, your vision made reality. Should have gone to KLTV. Welcome back to this week's Weekly Wind-Up. It was reported by the BBC that a Glasgow pensioner with a bet of 30,000 on the Conservative majority winning the UK general election has collected 240,000 pounds of winnings. The pensioner placed his bet at the odds of seven to one in a branch in Ladbrokes in the city centre on the 29th of April. The impact of the election. How do you feel about that, Paul? <laughs> How do you feel about that? I wish I was a gambler. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. uh, well, I wish I'd put my money on it. Yeah. You wish you'd put yeah. your money on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's only been a short time, um, space since the election, but how has the election impacted on us so far? I'd like to ask you three gentlemen. To, to, sorry, I'd like to ask you both. Um, do you think we have a local authority in five years' time? How do you feel about that? With all the austerity measures coming in, what do you think in five years' time? Well, I, I believe that we will have a, a local authority. It will be a different sort of authority. And uh, 
it's been coming for the last 20 years or more, and, uh, and it's been ev the wind of change has been progressing regardless of political uh, uh, colour. Um, we are probably going to get back to what we should have had in the first place, which is a local authority which is concerned about the welfare of the people who cannot support and look after themselves. So that sounds like um, you favour the smallest possible local authority, a small sort of small engagement. Um, I mean, I, when I moved to Huddersfield 15 years ago, one of the things I thought was absolutely fantastic was that Kirklees Council had performances for children in the park in the summer, mm. and we'd moved from, a, a, um, from the south of England, from a Tory-dominated council that did as little as it possibly could. When I came up here, what it meant was I was going to Greenhead Park and I was meeting other people and I felt part of the town very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and, you know, that's on the basis of, of taxation and uh, council, council taxes, direct grants and so on. It seems to me um, an, an enormously civilised thing to do, to have a local authority, people who live in the town, thinking not just about material welfare, but actually the cultural benefits of what goes on. If you walk around our town centre, it's empty shops everywhere. It, it looks appalling in various parts. Um, now, um, that can't be sorted out solely by private enterprise or retail businesses or anything like that. What it needs is some direct investment by people who care about the area. And I think the people who are most likely to care about the area are those people elected locally, um, with local budgets, um, who can support uh, s spending in such a way that, that we're not just trying to keep the, the homeless people off the street or um, uh, uh, people who need shelter um, safe, but actually we think about our whole society and we think about the way in which we benefit every citizen so that we all feel part of the town. Uh, I, I'm inclined to agree with the sentiment. <clears throat> what I recollect is dealing with local authorities, not just in this part of the country but in other parts of the country, and actually what they were doing was they were telling me what I was going to do and I'm thinking hang on a minute I'm actually paying your wages through rates taxes and everything else and the wind of change that we're now seeing is that councils and authorities are now actually asking us what we want and I perceive that the public are actually saying well we don't actually want that what we do want is to look after those people who need looking after either disabled the the people who've got learning problems mental health problems or what have you and all the rest of it is actually um, their trimmings which actually society generally could provide themselves if they wanted to and we would get far better value out of the money that we're paying uh, in terms of rates and taxes than we currently are getting I Again, I, I can understand what you're saying there, Brian and Paul, but there's, there has been erosion over the last 20 years. However, the council has always portrayed itself to be the corporate parent. And now all of a sudden, austerity kicks in from Whitehall. It seems simply saying to the, the, the children, well, now, and they're making them orphans, which is the community. So communities are disappearing right from right in front of our eyes. Of, of course, um, you use the word austerity there as, as if it's a fact that austerity is something that we need. Actually, I think it's clear that austerity is an ideology. That What we've just heard from Brian is that um, he doesn't want money to be spent because he wants control over it himself in a particular way. And that what he wants is, is, a, is, a, is a particular version of a local authority. Now, I'd agree. I want a particular version of local authority. I want, I want um, a civilised state that, that thinks about all aspects of my life because I can't trust unelected people whose, whose main concern is making money um, uh, uh, for themselves in order to avoid taxes. I can't trust them. So I need a whole series of things in place that do have control and do have laws. And, uh, um, and I would say that austerity is being used as a tool, not because it's necessary. If there is a disabled child there, that child should have every single resource that we can possibly point in their direction to give them the quality of life that they absolutely deserve. We shouldn't be funding a pond in a park if it's going to be to the detriment of the child in a wheelchair. But I would argue we can have a pond in a park that the child can be taken to in their wheelchair and enjoy and actually their life will be, will be damaged by not having those cultural amenities.
Well, can can we have both? Interesting debate. <laughs> can uh, we have both? Yeah, but not with the money that people are prepared to spend. Yeah. You know, there is only. No, a, it's, it's not with the money that the government is prepared to spend because because um, you know we we uh, bailed out banks to the tune of billions. We we allow people to get away with um, outpaying their taxes, and if we if we uh, picked up on all those things, if we made sure the money was going in the right direction, we wouldn't need to even be talking about austerity. We would actually just be in a, a, a better financial position. Um, we, and, and that of itself would generate wealth. Okay, uh, so what's business going to look like in five years? Do you think it's, it's boom, boom, boom? Uh, no, I don't think it's ever going to be boom, boom, boom. Um, uh, we are operating in a very big stage. It's a global economy. We don't know what threats are around the corner. We've got China that's in a slowdown. We've got Australia that's in recession because it's a satellite of China. We've got Europe, which is in disarray. We've got whatever's going to happen in Greece. Uh, we've got America, and people are forecasting America is about to go into a great big dip. Uh, we have manufacturing in the United Kingdom, which is the best manufacturing market in the world, but we have to export because 75% of business in this country is service, uh, so they're not using machines, so we've got to go abroad, but it's a difficult market. It's a very difficult market over there. <coughs> uh, I think that what business is about is actually uh, being sustainable, being responsible, and actually creating profit, which they will actually reinvest in them being social enterprises. I'm sure business will be in trouble in five years' time, but, but I can almost guarantee that, that the people who run the businesses will still be giving themselves enormous bonuses, <laughs> <laughs> however their companies are doing. I like to know, put you two on the same <laughs> panel today. <laughs> but yeah. um, okay, and finally, the welfare. What do you think the welfare is going to look like in five years' time? Will there be a state welfare? Because, you know, it, we talk about 20 years of this slow decline of local authority investment into communities. Um, what's coming next in the five years? How do you think welfare is going to be? I, I, I really don't know. But what I do perceive and what I've seen is a, a recognition over a period of time that we must not allow those people that can not to do um, and because that is depriving the child in a wheelchair who needs those resources because we're actually giving it to able-bodied people who can't be get off their backside and go to work yeah, yeah. I nearly swore then <laughs> <laughs> of course those those people are, are, are absolutely tiny tiny numbers yeah. and to demonize them actually shifts um, in, uh, concern away from sort of bigger and more important issues what welfare will look like probably in five years time is that that child in a wheelchair that we've talked about will be under increasing pressure by a government that would tax its parents if they had an extra bedroom. Um, those sorts of things will, uh, are probably likely to advance. We can probably def uh, turn some of those things back um, through, a, through a large protest movement. This government is democratically elected, but it, it's you know, elected on just over 30% of the vote, 37% uh, of the vote, um, and uh, it hasn't got a full mandate to do what it likes and therefore it needs to listen to what people say. Um, I, I think the turnout at the last election was something like 60-65%. So 65% uh, of the people actually got out of bed and put their vote in. The fact that so, so the other people didn't stay in their beds. What they did was they made the decision that politicians didn't represent them. Well, yes, I, 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 yeah. You should walk around Huddersfield in the middle of the day and see how many people in bed. Because yeah. I bet it's not lazy people, I bet it's people working night shifts. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I don't know. I, I, I earn my living in Huddersfield, so I'm pretty close to what's happening on the ground floor. Um, but in, in terms of the future, uh, those that we've got to stop allowing those that can't, can't. getting the money and depriving it from but those how, that need it. How many it. of them do you think there are? Just well, because they're on TV a lot, on, on Benefits Street, benefits, right. doesn't mean that they're, they're in large numbers. They I have tiny, I, tiny numbers I haven't numbers seen of the people. same programme as you, I don't think. <laughs> what I do know is there are 60 million people in the United Kingdom. There are 31 million almost working, which is the highest number that has ever worked in the history of the United Kingdom. There are 9 million people who are economically inactive for various reasons, because they've retired or they're over or they choose not to or they're caring or what have you. But there is a big chunk of of people in the middle who actually don't work, could work, and they're actually robbing the money from those who really do need to be supported, like the mentally like disabled. housewives, the, carers, no. these are the people who don't work. Uh, housewives the, uh, presumably don't work by choice. Carers... But, but you're the, they're, they're the ones you're marking out as, as not contributing to society. No, no, I didn't say that. You're putting words into my mouth. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, well, we'll just hold it there for now, gentlemen. Right? We can come back to it a longer time. I'm sure <laughs> we'll need a, a referee in here soon. Right? <laughs> well, thank you for that, gentlemen. Um, now mm. on to the final news story. Dogs from all over the UK go head-to-head -head as a fly ball comes to Huddersfield. More than 40 teams took part in a contest in which dogs complete a relay circuit while fetching a ball. The relationship between dog and owner was put on, well, put to the test, and it's a unique sporting event held in Huddersfield. The fly ball contest took place at Bradley Mills and saw teams of dogs and their owners compete in a series of challenges. And it drew competitors from all around the country. Keith, team captain of the Huddersfield Doghouse Flyball, you can't even make this up, can you? <laughs> Explain, it's only sport between team of dogs and their owners. There are four dogs and four owners to a team and they complete a relay circuit. The dogs have to jump over hurdles, fetch a tennis ball and the fastest to complete is the winner. It's fun, it's a great event, but with any sport, you enter to be competitive and to win. But there is a fun side to it. The Huddersfield team were beaten with storm chasers from Cheshire winning the top division prize. We've seen Britain's Got Talent two years on the bounce and voted for um, animals winning. So you think, I think we've gone a, a wee bit too far, gentlemen, with, with betting on animals ahead of <laughs> human beings? What do you reckon? Well, I did see British Got Talent this year, and I know Simon Cowell is a dog lover, yeah. and that act that won it, I thought, was absolutely fantastic. Even though they used the stunt dog? Uh, that, yeah, but it, it, it had to be trained to the same degree. <laughs> Just because one's got vertigo, you know, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> fantastic performance. As you know, Milton, we've got chickens at home. We've been training them for next year. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, that's all for this week, folks. Um, thank you to our guests, Paul and Brian. Thanks very much. And... We shall see you next week. And if you need to contact us about anything you've heard today, you can contact us by email on info at kirklyslocaltv.com, on Twitter at Weekly Windup, and on Facebook. See you next week. Bye-bye.